funding for Living in Virginia Route 11 was provided by the law firm of Warden, Altizer & Weaver, providing comprehensive legal services to its individual, institutional, and business clients throughout Virginia and West Virginia. For more than 200 years, the road I'm walking on has connected the cities and towns of the beautiful Shenandoah Valley. It's also been a link between the generations. Hello, and welcome to Living in Virginia. I'm Ned Barker. Today, if you travel through the valley, you probably take the interstate. You know, it makes sense since it's a lot quicker and more direct. But what I-81 offers in speed and convenience, it lacks in charm and history. For generations, traveling through the valley meant hitching up a horse and wagon, paying a toll, and riding on the Valley Turnpike, one of the most scenic and historic highways anywhere in Virginia, or the country for that matter. It has been superseded today uh, by Interstate 81, but it was the Interstate 81 of its time. It's a window on the past, a piece of American history a treasure chest of transportation memories. There is really only one way to see the valley, and that's down Route 11, that's down the Valley Pike. You can see farmlands, you can see church steeples, you can see towns. Long before white settlers traveled the road, Native Americans were here in the valley, hunting game, gathering food, and raising families. For thousands of years, they made the Shenandoah Valley their home, they recognized it for what it was, a natural corridor through the Appalachian Mountains. You can say there would be an, been a prehistoric Route 11. William Gardner is an archaeologist who has excavated Indian sites in the Shenandoah Valley and written a book on the Native Americans' 12,000 years of history here. His book is called Lost Arrowheads and Broken Pottery, and he says much of what we know about ancient Native American history comes from spear points like this. We also know that Indians carved out footpaths near Route 11 all the way up till the 18th century. By the 1720s and 1730s, when European settlers began arriving, the Native Americans no longer lived here, but they still used the valley to hunt and fish. Putting it in a practical sense, it was too dangerous a place to live in, so as far as practical use, uh, you came in, you hunted, you got out, or you came through on a warpath. If the Shenandoah Valley meant a hunting ground or a passageway for Native Americans, it meant open space and cheap land for European settlers. Settlers of German, English, and Scots-Irish descent. By the 1720s, conditions had grown crowded in William Penn's colony to the north. Virginia, west of the formidable Blue Ridge Mountains, was ripe for immigration. What Virginia was trying to do was build up a barrier against the incursions of the Indians and the French. The newcomers were happy to serve as that barrier. Water was plentiful, land cost a few shillings an acre, and up until the 1750s, relations between whites and Native Americans were pretty peaceful. At first, the new settlers arrived in a trickle, like leaves falling from a tree. In time, as word of the valley's richness spread, their numbers grew. Pennsylvania Germans mainly, with names like Stover and Height. Further up the valley, a growing community of Scots-Irish. Setting up a new home on the frontier took a lot of hard work 
So did building a church and starting a community. In fact, it was tough just getting your family and your possessions into the valley, thanks to the quality of the roads. They were, for the most part, just clearings, uh, cleared spaces, hacked through fields and hacked through forests. Certain seasons made it impossible to travel. When the first settlers arrived, the path they took was called the Indian Road, or the Warrior's Path. It may have started out as just a footpath. Before long, it would be wide enough for a parade of wagons. In the mid-18th century, road administration was nothing like it is today. County courts handled road matters with only a small amount of oversight from Williamsburg. Getting a new road built usually required a petition from the residents who wanted it. And citizens were required by law to help maintain the roads. In the mid-18th century, the Shenandoah Valley was an American frontier, a melting pot, a sanctuary of religious freedom and a land of opportunity, drawing not just Pennsylvania Germans and Scots-Irish, but Virginians from east of the Blue Ridge, like this man, America's first president. George Washington arrived in the valley in 1748. He would spend the next 10 years here. Just a teenager when he arrived, he was big for his age and had big ambitions. Well, he was a huge fella for a 16-year-old. He was about, I would say he was 16 going on 30. He came to the valley to work as a surveyor for Lord Fairfax, whose land holdings in the northern neck of Virginia totaled more than five million acres, making him one of the colony's richest property owners. Washington would make Winchester his home, a frontier town laid out in lots in 1744, the oldest English-speaking town west of the Blue Ridge. In the 1750s, Washington became a lieutenant colonel in the Virginia Regiment. His duties grew to include defending Virginia's frontier. During the French and Indian War, Washington kept his headquarters in Winchester and supervised the construction of Fort Loudoun. But Washington had political ambitions in addition to military ones. And in 1758, he began his political career when he stood for office in Frederick County, right on Route 11. It was from here where a young fellow by the name of George Washington began his career in public service. He was first elected to the Virginia House of Burgesses from here at the Frederick County Courthouse. George Washington, patriot, farmer, frontiersman, founding father. In the second half of the 18th century, after Washington had moved east, the road continued to grow in importance. It became known as the Great Philadelphia Wagon Road, by which tens of thousands of Americans moved south to Georgia and the Carolinas, and then west to Tennessee, Kentucky, and Ohio. As the 19th century unfolded, however, the road significance declined, just as Virginia began to lose some of her luster. Land values were dropping. The state was losing population. Farmers faced depression. The solution for many Virginians meant leaving the state but for what destination? Those who were left said it was time to tinker with the state's economy. The idea was that improved commerce and transportation was going to save us all. A new era of transportation improvements was about to begin. In 1816, the General Assembly created a new state agency, the Board of Public Works, and a new fund to help pay for new roads and canals, the Fund for Internal Improvements. In the valley, the idea of turning the stage road, as it was called in those days, into a turnpike 
had circulated soon after the establishment of the Board of Public Works. At first, the idea went nowhere. There are a number of false starts in the 1820s uh, for building a road, and then finally, in 1834, uh, they get a charter of incorporation. Bushrod Taylor was the Valley Turnpike Company's first president. He operated a profitable hotel bearing his name in Winchester. This is it right behind us. Uh, this was the finest hotel in Winchester. Uh, it was one of the finest in Virginia. Taylor pictured the bells of countless Conestoga wagons tinkling as horses carried flour and grain to market. So did other investors. Most of the investors were people who lived in the four counties that the Valley Turnpike crossed, Augusta County, Rockingham County, Shenandoah County, and Frederick County. Many of the stockholders were merchants, uh, attorneys, physicians, uh, people who uh, lived along the route of the pike. Uh, whose lands would uh, improve in value if the pike were built. Shares of stock cost $25 apiece. Outside of private investors in the valley, merchants in Baltimore showed the greatest interest in the pike. Baltimore, not Richmond, not Alexandria, not Norfolk, but Baltimore puts its money behind the turnpike. Baltimore had an extremely forward-looking, aggressive uh, merchant class in it. The city's merchants saw the valley as an agricultural powerhouse. There was a, a thriving wheat trade in the valley and in the Potomac, uh, stretching not only into the Shenandoah Valley, but to western Maryland and, of course, to central Pennsylvania. And all of this was focused on Baltimore, which was the great wheat exporting center of our region in those days. Just as merchants in Baltimore saw a toll road as a way to better connect the two areas, valley farmers saw it as a way to reduce their costs. What made the Valley Pike better than other roads for shipping products to market was its surface, made of a material called macadam. And it was a process of putting on the roads um, layers of rock. First large rocks, then a medium-sized rock, and then a small rock. And then usually crushing that with some kind of a roller. The turnpike was built in stages. It stretched for more than 90 miles, from Winchester to Stanton. The cost? A little more than $400,000. It was finished by 1841. The turnpike consisted of 15 toll gates around this time, but more would be added later on. Revenues for the road's maintenance came from tolls, the size of which depended on the cargo. While farmers transported wheat and flour to market on the pike, drovers used it to herd livestock. Although after the road was macadamized, the stones hurt the animal's feet and drovers used parallel roads closer to the Allegheny Mountains. Leather goods were shipped out on the pike. So was pig iron. Stagecoach travel thrived on the Valley Pike. Rail service wouldn't connect Stanton, Lexington, and Harrisonburg with Winchester until after the Civil War. For at least part of the Turnpike's history, gatekeepers earned $10 a month. They collected the money from sun up to 10 p.m. and often accepted eggs or bread instead of money. Their biggest headache? Shunpikers, people who used the road without paying. Weather could also be a big problem. But all things considered, the pike was still one of the top roads in Virginia. One of the beauties of the Valley Pike was it was already a developed region. All of that population kind of pent up who wanted to use it. So I think that accounts for its, its uh, uniform success. But the road was less of a success for investors. The Turnpike 
did not produce great dividends for its uh, investors. Uh, in the first decade, maybe only one dividend is declared. And its hardships would grow in the 1860s with a war that lasted more than four years and sent thousands of troops up and down the valley, troops wearing uniforms of blue and gray. During the first half of the 19th century, slaves of every age traveled Virginia's turnpikes, often against their will. And by 1861, the issue of what to do about slavery had so divided the country, gunfire was now drowning out debate. In 1862, Thomas Jonathan Jackson, Stonewall Jackson, defended the valley. If the valley is lost, Jackson said, Virginia is lost. As a professor at the Virginia Military Institute in Lexington in the 1850s, students ridiculed him. On the battlefield a decade later, he would earn a place in history. In 1862, Washington had much to fear from the Shenandoah Valley. On the one hand, the valley was a corridor pointing southern troops toward points of strategic importance in the north, including the nation's capital. It was also the breadbasket of the Confederacy. Livestock was, was uh, raised here. Uh, leather and big tanneries was produced. For nearly four months, Jackson and his men outmaneuvered the federal troops. The foot cavalry, as they were called, swept up and down the valley, from Stanton to Winchester, and from Charlottesville to present-day Franklin, West Virginia. The fighting began in late March and lasted until June, when Jackson and his men headed east toward Richmond. In late May of 1862, he fooled General Nathaniel Banks into thinking his men would march into battle straight up the Valley Pike. In fact, they marched up the east side of Massanutten Mountain and attacked Banks by surprise near Strasburg, routing the Union troops and sending them back over the Potomac, frightening the North, tying up additional troops, and keeping the pressure away from Richmond. The Confederacy's good fortune wouldn't last long, however. In 1863, at the Battle of Chancellorsville, Jackson was shot and killed by his own men, leaving Confederate troops holding their heads in shock. The following year, Lincoln's top commander, General Ulysses S. Grant, decided that to win the war, his troops would have to neutralize the valley. The man to do the job was General Philip Sheridan, whose army totaled 35,000 men. In September of 1864, Sheridan defeated General Jubal Early in the Battle of Third Winchester. A few days later, he defeated Early again, this time at Fisher's Hill. Sheridan then moved his troops up the Valley Pike, and in late September and early October, he stationed his men around Harrisonburg, where he launched a campaign to burn the valley. Sheridan carried out his orders with ruthless efficiency. Psychologically, it's, it's been something that's, that's been imprinted, burned, if you will, into the minds of valley people ever since that time. Uh, you bring up the name of Sheridan or George Custer, who was doing a lot of the burning under Sheridan's command, and people just kind of bridle at the name. Six months later, Richmond lay in ruins. The South was shattered. General Robert E. Lee surrendered, and the war was over. Never before or since has the Old Dominion seen the kind of violence and destruction that came with the Civil War. The state's transportation infrastructure was largely destroyed. In fact, the war dealt a lethal blow to the state's network of toll roads. Many turnpike companies simply went into bankruptcy. Although somehow, the Valley Turnpike Company managed to survive. 
The latter years of the 19th century dealt even more challenges to the pike, like severe flooding in the 1870s, and a lot more competition from the railroads. But those things didn't spell the end of the turnpike. Instead, it was this, the automobile. Shortly after the turn of the century, automobiles began having an impact on Virginia's roads. And here in the valley, its impact was first felt on the macadam. Drivers didn't like the frequent toll gates either. At the time, the man in charge of the Valley Turnpike Company was Harry Bird, a young newspaper publisher in Winchester and an apple grower. Bird's political aspirations would lead him to the governor's office and to the United States Senate. He had a huge impact on transportation in the Old Dominion. As president of the Valley Turnpike Company, Bird realized that the future of Virginia's highways lay in free roads, not in turnpikes. And by 1918, he convinced the state to buy up the company's stock and take control of the road. In December 1918, the stockholders of the Valley Turnpike Company held a special meeting and following the advice of their board of directors, voted to dissolve the company and transfer the turnpike back to the state. The automobile may have meant an end to the turnpike company, but it hardly meant an end to the road. Just the opposite. In the years ahead, it would be paved and widened and become part of the most heavily traveled highway in the eastern United States. Initially, it became State Route 33, but not for long. In the 1920s, it became US 11, part of a highway that would ultimately stretch from northern New York all the way to New Orleans. Gas stations started popping up along the highway. So did many motels and tourist homes. For visitors, the valley's top attractions in those days were its caverns. Endless Caverns, for example, offered free camping and advertised it would give tours any time of day or night, 365 days of the year. In the early 1930s, the road was widened in many places, but the changes were sometimes controversial. In the early days, we had trees lining Edinburgh, and it was beautiful, and then they widened the road, the street, Route 11 was widened. As and they took the trees and they, and they took the front porches off the houses. In some cases, people moved their houses back away from the road a little bit. Following the Second World War, it had a lot more traffic on it. In fact, there was getting to be too much traffic on Route 11, making it dangerous. A new road was needed, a split highway, an interstate. The interstate system was begun in the 1950s during the Eisenhower administration. What President Eisenhower wanted to do was move defense equipment and personnel from any one point to another, from one end of this nation to the other, and from north to south, east to west. I-81 was built in sections. The cost, about a million dollars a mile. It would take me approximately six to seven hours to go from Staten to Bristol. Now with the interstate, it takes about three hours and 15 minutes if you do not stop anywhere. No sooner was I-81 complete than it began to have an effect on Route 11. A lot of the businesses along Route 11, a lot of them went out of business. Business is a bit better today. Route 11 is starting to come back. So how should we view Route 11 and its contribution to the valley? For me today, the Valley Pike uh, is, is still so unique because you can travel from one end of it to another and travel through so many eras of valley history from colonial times all the way up into the 20th century. 
the road really in a way is living. And if you understand its history, it just gives you a far deeper appreciation for the whole region. Route 11, the Valley Turnpike, the Stage Road, the Great Philadelphia Wagon Road, the Old Indian Trail. It's a highway of Virginia memories, a corridor of Valley dreams. For a VHS copy of the program you've just seen, please send $24.95 to WVPT or contact us for information on how to pay by credit card. <laughs>